Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, friends, to the online book launch of Life Under the Palms, the sublime world of the anti-colonialist Jakob Hafner. The book is written by Paul van der Velde, translated by Lisbeth Benink, and includes uh, generous excerpts from Hafner's own writing, um, which reads uh, very fresh and lively even to our 21st century ears. The book is published by NUS Press under our Ridge Books imprint. We're very pleased to be organizing this online event uh, together with friends from the Barefoot Bookshop in Colombo, Sri Lanka. Uh, an event uh, is, this event is, uh, is something of an experiment. We hope you will indulge us. It's organized across a few different locations. Uh, on the far west of the Eurasian landmass from Holland uh, to Sri Lanka and then to Singapore. Um, it's quite a learning curve to try to create an online event that takes advantage of the placelessness of cyberspace, but bringing also, we hope, just a touch of spirit of place as well. Um, the format, though, is fairly traditional. Uh, after I finish, our friends from Barefoot will extend their welcome to you, uh, and then we'll officially launch the book. One needs a mechanism to launch the book. And, and then we'll proceed uh, with a discussion with the book's author, translator, uh, and commentators and we'll have a Q&A uh, with those of you joining us on Facebook Live after that. Thank you again, all of you, for joining us. And um, let us now go to the Barefoot Bookshop. Greetings from Sri Lanka and welcome to the Barefoot Bookshop. It is our great pleasure to have this opportunity to collaborate with the NUS Press on the book launch of Life Under the Palms, written by Paul Vanderbilt and translated by Elizabeth Benique. The Barefoot Bookshop was started in 1990 and over the last 30 years we've become known for our thought-provoking selection of titles from both Sri Lankan and international authors, as well as our specialist focus on books of Sri Lankan art, architecture, design, history and photography. Life Under the Palms is now currently available at the Barefoot Bookshop. We hope you enjoy the panel discussion and you have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Um... How nice to be there, if only for a few moments on video. Uh, now the time has come to launch the book. Um, now, usually, you know, we'd let off fireworks or release a flock of doves, uh, <laughs> but it's Zoom world, so we'll have to make do with a video. Cue launch. Well, the book is launched. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Uh, that brings us now to our, to our discussion. So uh, leading the discussion uh, about Life Under the Palms is uh, Michael Bass. He's an anthropologist and senior researcher um, with the Max Planck Institute in Halle, Germany. Incidentally, as it happens, the city where Jakob Hafner was born, although Michael is actually based in Amsterdam, um, the city where um, Jakob Hafner spent his final years. Uh, and Michael continues to work at the University of Amsterdam as well. For the previous seven years, he was based here in Singapore at NUS with the Asia, Re Asia Research Institute. Michael's research is mostly India related uh, and looks at questions of migration, transnationalism, socioeconomic mobility, gender, and the body. He's the author of a recent book, Muscular India, Masculinity, Mobility, and the New Middle Class, which has been very well received. Uh, his next book is on Dutch colonial history, 
of the 16th and 17th centuries, so somewhat earlier than Mr. Hoffner's lifetime. So we're in very uh, capable hands. Um, after Mike, Michael leads a discussion with our panelists, as I said before, we'll open the floor uh, to those of you who have any questions for the whole group. But please give your questions in the chat. So over to you, Michael. Thank you, Peter, and, um, and thank you, um, thank you, and US Press for organizing this and for for asking me to moderate the discussion and the book launch of a of a book that I highly enjoyed for various reasons. Um, probably the most important being that a lot of the places that Hafner visited um, himself, I visited in recent years as well. So. Um, reading the book again because I was already familiar with uh, uh, the original Dutch version that I, I have here, which I, I highly enjoyed reading. Um, quite a, a while ago, I think it initially came out in 2008, but reading it again now and, and um, it really brought back memories of these places, but also the interactions I've had with Paul about the topic over time. Um, so without much further ado, I would like to introduce our um, our main speaker of today, or our main guest, Paul, Paul van der Velde, um, but also Razine Selly, who will be joining us from Singapore to comment on the book, and Lisbeth Pangaja Benning, who translated the book, and, um, and will be asking and conversing with her about how she translated this book. Um, so I think I see Paul has joined us, Lisbeth has joined us, and Razine has joined us. Let me start by introducing Paul. Paul is uh, Paul van der Velde, uh, author and academic, um, IAS old hand, I guess, of um, the International Institute of Asian Studies, but a person that I mainly got to know through uh, the biennial conference uh, of Asian studies uh, that he organizes once in two years. Um, and, and Paul has been uh, doing a magnificent job with this conference and has also been, in that sense, taken on quite a leadership within um, in a, a, the, the, the field of Asian studies. Paul has published extensively on topics related to Dutch colonialism and has done so also separate publications looking at uh, Hafner's work. Um, like, as I mentioned earlier, this book first came out in Dutch and the, the truly fantastic thing now is that the book is now also available in English so that we, so that a much wider readership can, can appreciate what Hafner wrote about the world the way he saw the world and and what are we talking about Paul today mainly is what we can still learn from these texts so I'm, I'm incredibly pleased that this book has come out and that it's so wonderfully distributed not just by annual express in Singapore but that it's also available in barefoot bookshop one of my own favorite bookshops and and I think it's a definitely a place where it should be available so that's a great job um, let me turn to our other two guests uh, Razine Sally is a Sri Lankan British writer and his new book, which I'm, I'm very keen on reading myself, it's been on a, on a pile of books on Sri Lanka that I, I purchased recently, is titled Return to Sri Lanka, Travels in a Paradoxical Island. And it's, it's play, uh, published by Juggernaut. He's currently a visiting associate professor at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National <laughs> University of Singapore and previously taught at the London School of Economics. He was also chairman of the Institute of Policy Studies, the main economic policy think tank in Sri Lanka and a senior advisor to the Minister of Finance. He has been director of the European Center for International Political Economy, a global economy think tank in Brussels and has held visiting research and teaching positions in the USA, France, Australia, and Hong Kong. He was also chair of the World Economics Forum Global Agenda Council on Competitiveness. So I think a very esteemed guest to have among us, and I'm highly looking forward to your comments on the book later on. Um, our second guest today is Lisbeth Pangaja Benik, um, who's the translator of the book. Uh, Lisbeth combined her history study at the Rijks University of Utrecht in the Netherlands with her training as Bharata Natyam dancer under Smriti Rajamani Knols in Amsterdam, Mumbai, as well as Bangalore. After accomplishing, accomplishing her Arangatram in 1981 already and her graduation in 1983, she performed and taught for many years in the Netherlands and abroad. 
seeking a deeper understanding and knowledge of Indian dance in the context of the ancient traditions in which it is rooted. She found a scholar and master who could open up this world to her in the person of Raja Dikshitar, an independent researcher and a scholar belonging to the Chidambaran Sri Shiva Nataraja temple, um, and a temple that actually also features in the book. In the past years, she has pursued her interest in Indian history and culture, such as dance and its evolution, astro archaeology, temple traditions, and mythology. But most of all, of course, she is here as um, as a guest because she did such a wonderful job on translating this book. Thank you. Um, I'll be asking you some questions later on as well. But let's let's start with Paul. Um, welcome, Paul. Um, you're, Thank you. You're, you're also joining us from Amsterdam. We're actually. Um, Lisbeth is joining us from the Netherlands as well. Amsterdam, uh, Paul is joining us from a different location in Amsterdam. And I am, and Arvin, of course, from, from Singapore. So it's quite a quite an international setup we've got going here. Um, as I mentioned, when I read the book, um, it really brought back memories of visiting various places um, in India and Sri Lanka over time. Earlier this year, I spent time in Colombo, in Gaul, in Betty Koloa, um, in India. I've been a regular visitor of Pondicherry. I know the various Dutch um, uh, settlements that were once there. Actually, they're all gone or decaying under the blistering sun on the Coromandel coast. Um, so it was a wonderful way to re with these places at, the, at a time when they were, of course, very vibrant places, and, and Havner describes them in detail. But, of course, towards the end of the book, the book takes a, a sadder tone to a certain degree because suddenly we find Havner back in Amsterdam after traveling and, and really enjoying his time in Asia, um, he, he returned with the idea that one day he would actually find himself back in, in, in Asia, but he couldn't. Yeah. And it kind of also reminded me of the situation we're all in right now, where we're all kind of interested in, in Asia and being in Asia, but we're unable to travel. So I, I would like to reflect on that a little bit more later on as well. But first of all, I think I would like to ask you if you could tell us a bit more about your fascination with Hafner. So when did you first encounter his work and what piqued your interest there, Paul? Okay, yes, thank you. Um, for that, we have to go back to the, uh, to the end of the 80s of the previous century when I was working um, and now fasten your seatbelts at the Institute for the History of the European Expansion and its reaction of Leiden University. Uh, it was one of the most internationally oriented uh, institutes of Leiden University with many visitors from Asia. However, that did not imply that its director or staff members were internationalized. Rather, they were inward looking and I was amazed to find out that they denied that such a thing as Dutch imperialism ever existed. It mm. was not difficult for me to I prove see. It was not difficult for me to prove the opposite, but when I put my thoughts on paper in an article, I soon found out that it was not very beneficial for my academic career. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, As a deus ex machina, an Indian textile tycoon living in the Netherlands asked me to make an overview of what was written in Dutch in the 17th and 18th century about India uh, with an eye on a movie. Uh, when I discovered uh, the completely forgotten writer, Jakob Hafner, I knew I hit the jackpot because I found out that he had written no less than five uh, travel stories, which if one sets, uh, which sets them in chronological order, it reads as an autobiography yeah. with both enlightened and romantic views. His travels in a palanquin, describing his love story with the Devidashi uh, Mamia, was fit for a movie. So a script was written, yeah. <laughs> uh, but it was written so badly that the textile tycoon discontinued the project after he had sunk 50,000 pounds in it. Amazing. I thought this cannot be the end of it. And together with my Hafner brother, Jaap de Moor, who was also working uh, at our institute, we decided on an academic republication of the works uh, of uh, Jakob Hafner in three volumes in the famous Linschoten series, which is yeah. comparable to the Hackloid Society series. 
so far, mostly very dull books were published in it. And for the first time, uh, the first print was sold out in no time, thanks to the very readable and uh, humoristic way Hafner wrote. They were published uh, from 1992 to 97. And in 1993, and this is very important, we also did, did a republication of his essay on missionaries and missionary societies, in which Hafner made minced meat, if that is possible for a vegetarian, of this Western endeavor. In the first global treatment, in this first global treatment of this topic, uh, he concluded that missionary activity uh, was useless. His anti-colonial stance saw him ostracized from society, but he became a popular author nevertheless, thanks to his travel stories. And that's how I more or less get in, got involved uh, with, uh, with Hafner, well, due to his rather subversive character. And <laughs> yeah. I think that story in itself already sort of asked for um, another article or book maybe altogether. I mean, I'd love to know more about that 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 yeah. film that was once in development and a, a textile baron yeah. or, or, or type who, who sank money in that. Um, yeah. You yourself have, a, have been a scholar of Asia for most of your professional life. Um, you initially worked on Taiwan. I think you speak still quite a bit of uh, quite a word of Chinese. Um, you organize uh, one of the most influential um, Asia conferences uh, every other year. Of course, you've been involved in setting up the IAS newsletter, um, which is one of the prime publications for people to publish shorter pieces on, on Asia. Um, how would you say that you take inspiration from Hafner in all of this? Does, does the influence of Hafner feature in, um, in, in your own work and the, the way you relate to Asia? Yeah, if, if, uh, of course it did. Uh, Hafner inspired me a lot because doing research on, it, on him brought me to many places around the world and especially in Asia. Uh, I followed in his footsteps in, for example, Sri Lanka, about which he wrote his book, Travel uh, on Foot Through the Island of Ceylon. Apart yeah. from the, the, the discovery aspect, he also inspired me to become a kind of middleman, a broker, facilitating contacts uh, at all kinds of levels between Asia and Europe, uh, which is, as you already mentioned, exemplified by the foundation of the International Convention of Asia Scholars with its region and disciplinary transcending nature and closely attached to it, the ICOS Book Prize, now consisting of nine languages and nearing 1,000 submissions for its 2022 Kyoto edition. So, well, in that sense, he inspired me a lot to, to bring people together and ideas yeah. together. Yeah, that's so fantastic that you mentioned that, especially the, the ICAS Book Prize, which has been that's been such a so force in that sense, and I've actually seen colleagues who who are on the on the committee on the jury committee receive those books and seeing the kind of wealth of Asia studies that are being published annually is really really quite something and really quite different, I guess, from the time of Hafner himself, because. Yeah. If I think of Hafner publishing this work, there must have been a market for this at a time when it came out. And people must have been hungry for this. But what was it? Can you tell us a bit more about the situation at the time? Was there, um, was this like a, a market that was already blooming? Were there other publications that Hafner was competing with? How did that work actually? Or was his really the only one that could be found on bookshop shelves? No, no, he was certainly not the only one. There was a, a large literature on travel already from the 15th, 16th century onwards. So yeah. uh, he stepped in a tradition. And then, of course, he also stepped in this anti-colonial tradition, going back to Bishop de las Casas, who wrote about mm. uh, the murder of 30 million Indians in, uh, in uh, South America. Was he actually specifically influenced by him? Did he read him, for instance? Yeah, Was he, he aware he, of the... Yes, but because uh, we found the, uh, let's say, a copy of the manuscript of the treatise or the essay against missionary societies in the Taylor's Museum in Harlem. And mm. there he was forced by the committee. He won the prize. He, so it was a contest and he won the prize. 
but then he had to uh, uh, put uh, footnotes to his texts so as to prove that he, what he was saying was not nonsense. And there, yeah. from, from that, we can derive uh, his, the vast range of books he he he, uh, he read. And of course, he was multilingual. His parents were French-speaking, German-speaking, and uh, and of course, he acquired Dutch as well. So it's uh, so he he was quite well informed. And at the time, of course. Amsterdam was one of the central places for uh, publications which could not be published uh, anywhere else as well. Yeah. 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 Is that what you say um, would also still be the reason why we should read Hafner for his anti colonial position, for how he stood in relation to these debates already then at the late 18th century? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes, that's Hafner. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> uh, and that was an engraving of Reinhard Winkler, one of the the uh, most known engravers at the time in the Netherlands. And Hafner uh, actually had been uh, uh, learning uh, how to draw in uh, in his atelier of Winkler's atelier, and uh, that's why we got all these beautiful uh, drawing also uh, in the book now. But the most important thing we can learn from Hafner, I think, is if you decide to go and live somewhere else, uh, is to immerse yourself in, in your new locality and learn the language and customs. As Hafner stated, he was happy if he was taken for an Indian. He felt in heaven, in what I call emporial, as opposite to imperial surroundings, and those, and those one could certainly find on the Coromandel coast. Mm. These were multilingual and multicultural places far away from the imperial capitals of empires, where people happily mingled and partied, as we can read in Hafner's work, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you, you earlier mentioned, you, you mentioned that, uh, you mentioned Yab de Moor, yes, uh, yeah. with whom you published. I mean, the, the book is also dedicated to him, and you even call him exactly. your Hafner brother. Um, mm -hmm. So, so can you tell us a bit more about him as well? It's like, what yeah. did you, what did turn, did did you guys turn into brothers? Like, why? Yeah, yeah oh. well, the, the half their brothers, of course. Yeah, and we were yeah. both from the the same province here in the Netherlands, from Zeeland. Although he was more of the Protestant uh, uh, part of society, and I'm more of the Catholic society. But All okay, right. Jaap, Jaap was my colleague at the Institute for the History of European Expansion. And since we were involved in so many activities, which according to the mores of the university department did not fit in with our job description, we stepped out of this academic environment and Jaap ironically ended in the mi section military history <laughs> of the <laughs> army, while he yeah. himself had been a draft dodger. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We however, we never regretted the steps we took, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, and that's why he is not in the show, so to say. He, he uh, contrived multiple sclerosis and uh, he's fully immobilized physically. Fortunately, oh, he can still speak. And what he said is, says is frequently Hafnerian, but always brilliant. He yeah. is still preaching Hafner whenever he can. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Earlier, you mentioned you because we have we have some viewers from Sri Lanka and, and Hafner yeah. didn't spend a lot of time in no, Sri Lanka no. compared to the time he spent in India. Um, yeah. But you said you traced his steps. What what was kind of sort of in your recollection still the most memorable moment when you found or encountered Hafner in Sri Lanka that you recall from your travels there? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it can be summarized quite quickly. It was the whole atmosphere which mm. he described, like with the with the birds flying through the air and the people, yeah, uh, well, quite most of them quite happy. Although, of course, we 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 could not go to Yafna Patnam at the time because of the war at mm. the moment at that time. Yeah. But overall, I felt a kind of joy and also, of course, some small connections due to the uh, well, uh, more or less brick presence of the Dutch in in uh, in Sri Lanka. And also, I, I you know I met a lot of people who were uh, descendants of the Dutch burghers in, in, uh, in Sri Lanka, oh, yeah. who, who have been administering the country uh, during the uh, English occupation. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a very clear connection there as well. Um, yeah. So, of course, so so this is all super positive, and I think we yeah. can all agree that Hafner continues to make that kind of contribution and, and makes us think about the colonial position at the time as well, because overwhelmingly what you see in, in, in research is that the assumption is still that everybody agreed what happened in, in colonial days. So um, obviously this is a very positive book, but the, recently there was, a, uh, there was also a critical blog post by historian um, Richard uh, Simon, who I think mm. is Columba based. And he argued that, um, you know, um, when you reflect a little bit on your assessment of Havner as an anti-colonialist, he suggests that his career in the Indies was also typical in every respect of many 18th century R R European imperialists. And, and Simon continues the argument that saying that he was merely against its rapacity. So how would you respond to this? Well, uh, I also read his uh, critique, but I cannot take it very seriously. Mm. Uh, of course, Hafner lived in a colonial context, but that did not prevent him from becoming one of the fiercest and most daring anti-colonialists. To make that ex explicitly clear, I think it would be a good idea to translate his essay uh, against missionaries and missionary societies in English, which might also convince my colleague Simon that Hafner was not an imperialist. Mm. Yeah. So, so would you say because um, you know, I mean, I'm sure that wasn't all well received among uh, um, you know members of the, the ruling class of the no. colonial class. So how did they how did they respond to his allegations and his assessment? Well, he was completely ostracized from society. Uh, as uh, there were essays written to refute his essay, and but you have to. Uh, you have to go back to, let's say, to the frame of mind in the beginning of the 19th century in Calvinist Holland. So mm. uh, what was pre, uh, prevalent was uh, the um, theory that nothing which was not in the Holy Scriptures was a corruption of the Holy Scriptures. So when, when Hafner started talking about the Vedas as a source of knowledge, these people who... Uh, who were against Hafner? They said, "Well, this, this, this is all, uh, this is all fake." So, that, mm. to use a modern term, because it's all a corruption from what is written in the Bible. And by the way, people also thought at that point in time still that the Earth was created in uh, six or seven thousand BC. So, I, you know, you must imagine this world was so narrow-minded. It's incredible. Yeah, mm. and then for a person like this to uh, still be able to live in this this environment. I mean, yeah. with yeah. hardly any with hardly any money, it's incredible. Yeah. Did he have any allies? You know, there must have been. Were there people in the press who championed his arguments? Um, he certainly must have had allies, and uh, I know, for example, one of his uh, his publisher in in Harlem who was also involved in Tyler's, uh, uh, Tyler's Theological Society, uh, was very much in favor of him. And he, I think he really promoted him and also uh, uh, took care that, well, that his, his uh, book won this prize, which came with a rather big amount of money with like 400 guilders, which was about, let's say, 50,000 euros at this point in time. Yeah. Right. Um I think this is a good moment probably to yes. ask one of our guests to comment on your book as well. Um, as I introduced earlier, um, we have with us here uh, Razin Sally, who um, himself just recently published a book uh, titled Return to Sri Lanka, Travels in a Paradoxical Island, an incredibly well-received book published by Juggernaut. And I'm, I'm very excited to have him here as a guest because I was really wondering how how he read the book and, and if he was able to also shed some light on the ideas that Paul highlighted um, by analyzing Hafner's work. Okay, well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Michelle, and uh, also to Peter and NUS Press uh, for the invitation to join you. Um, uh, well, let, let me first say what, um, what 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 I like about the book in a general sense, um, and then just have some. Uh, I'll make some comments about 
the Sri Lankan bit of it. Surprise, surprise, given my mm -hmm. my own background. Um, and end with a with a question for Paul about uh, Hafner's experience in Sri Lanka uh, that really goes beyond his biography because I'd, I'd like to hear more about what he writes in that book, um, Travels on Foot in the Island Ceylon, which of course has been uh, translated into English. Uh, but let me, let me come to that right at the end. Uh, well, I'm, I'm very happy that uh, Paul decided to write a popular biography, as he puts it, of, uh, of Hafner uh, after he republished uh, Hafner's original uh, writing. Uh, and equally happy that uh, Lisbeth Benning has translated it into English so that it reaches a, a wider audience. And the reasons for that are very simple. Uh, from the first page, Hafner comes across as an immediately likable, sympathetic uh, character. And of course, uh, he, he writes very freshly, very vividly uh, in, in a fluent style that draws one in straight away and keeps one turning the page. And I think uh, Lisbeth's, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't uh, speak or read Dutch, but uh, my impression is that Lisbeth's uh, translation uh, conveys that, that freshness and fluency very well indeed. Um, Hafner as a sympathetic character, well, I, I, I think the, me as a reader and other readers would associate immediately with uh, different aspects of his life story, uh, the poverty and the suffering he suffered in childhood. And then of course, later in late adulthood when he was marooned in, uh, in the Netherlands, unable to get back to Asia. Uh, his uh, instinctive sympathy with the native underdog and antipathy to uh, colonial oppressors, uh, his love of mestizo society, uh, particularly that passage in the book on Sadras uh, on the Coromandel coast. Um, and in addition to his humanity, his uh, wide-eyed wonder as he travels uh, and absorbs everything uh, he sees and the people he encounters. Um, and all, all of that, I think Paul has conveyed uh, with, with great uh, vivacity in his in his own comments, it was a delight to hear what he what he had to say. Um, I mean, I must admit, if if I think of my my travel writing pantheon, both in terms of contemporary writers and writers from eras past, uh, they tend to be much more um, cooler and detached than Hafner. And Paul, I think, rightly says that Hafner is is a romantic and writes in a very Romantic style. It's uh, it's highly colorized. It's gushing. It's swooning. It's frequently enraptured, uh, and that's very much part of the attraction of it. Um, my pantheon is is somewhat different. Uh, in the the kind of cooler, more detached writers I'm thinking of, uh, for example, Robert Knox, who wrote perhaps the best book a foreigner ever wrote on Ceylon, uh, and that was from the the late 1600s, so about a century before Hafner. Um, uh, and Robert Knox was the model for um, Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe. Uh, Knox writes about the Andean Kingdom in a much more detached style, and by doing so, conveys much more of, uh, conveys a lot of the complexities, the different layers, uh, the paradoxes of the society in which he finds himself at the time. That, but that's, I think, a very minor, minor caveat. Uh, as I said, I think very much part of the attraction of Hafner's life story and writing is that uh, he displays his romanticism openly, uh, completely unpretentiously and without any guilt whatsoever. Uh, as, as I said, what particularly interests me in the book is, uh, in Paul's biography, is the section on Ceylon. It's only 30 pages of the book. Uh, Hafner spent, I guess, less than a year in Ceylon, 1783, I think it, I think it was. Yes, uh, yes. So it, it pales in comparison with his much more varied and longer Indian uh, experience, 
He saw a relatively small slice of uh, Ceylon. It was the Jaffna Peninsula and that three-week walk down the coast to Colombo after your visit or visits to uh, to Sri Lanka, Paul. Um, uh, I, for, for writing my own book, I was in Jaffna in the peninsula uh, on three occasions. Uh, I visited the islands. So that initial passage where Hafner finds himself on the boat in the voluptuous arms of his uh, lover. Uh, he's actually coming down the lagoon past kites to Jaffna yeah. town. And then he sets up house, perhaps on one of the streets that the Dutch built, uh, quite close to the fort and the esplanade. Maybe he walked in the grounds of Jaffna Fort, which was the biggest fort of its kind the Dutch built in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the Asian colonies. Uh, and went to the local, where maybe he didn't go to the Kirk there, given his proclivities. Um, all of that bombed to smithereens, uh, and, and so on. And, and that, uh, that walk down the coast reminded me of going to Mannar Island and uh, uh, Aripu uh, um, on, uh, on, on, on the, uh, the mainland coast. Um, I, I, I think what those 30 pages did for me was to think of... Think of Hafner in that Dutch colonial context, because it was barely just on, just over a decade before the Dutch had to cede Ceylon to the British. And that was accomplished in 1795. So about 12 years after Hafner was there. He was there very much during the waning years of that one and a half century of Dutch colonial rule in Ceylon. So it made me think of those times and of how Dutch colonial rule compared with the Portuguese before and then the British shortly, shortly afterwards. Uh, I guess Hafner would have been very critical of British Anglican missionary activity a few decades after he was there. Um, so my question to you, Paul, is, is really this. Um, what does Hafner have to say in, in his travel book on Ceylon about the Dutch colonialists uh, in, in Jaffna Patnam itself, what he encountered down in Colombo, um, how critical was he was he of them, and of course of the the prelates of the pastors of the Dutch Reformed Church that he must have encountered along along the way. Uh, yeah. That's what I, I think I'd like to hear. I'd like to hear more about. Let, let me let me stop there. Okay. Yeah. Well. Um, uh, you know, he he uh, at the let's say. At the end of his uh, life, so three or four years before he died, he wrote his treatise against missionary society, and therein he he co he compared on a global scale all kinds of missionary efforts and also colonial efforts, and and described uh, all the negative uh, consequences of that project. In his travel stories, um, he he is also critical, but much more um, in a casual way. So it's written in between the lines. So he describes, for example, with great sympathy, the life of a, of a cor corporal uh, in the VOC army um, who has been living there for three or four generations and was completely integrated in society. And we didn't, didn't even know <laughs> that the Netherlands still existed, by the way. So he... he it was more with this, with, let's say, a personal feeling that he that he uh, wrote about uh, colonialism in his uh, in his travel stories while not running away from criticism yeah would you like to respond to to paul um no no i mean well i i i, I definitely write, like to read uh the english translation of uh of hafner's book in fact a, a friend of mine in Colombo, who is probably watching, uh, sent me a photo of the title page. Uh, I think she 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 has the book. The, that's the yeah. 1821 uh, translation. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, but well, that's, but that's you see, that's the translation of travels uh, of travels on foot, because the missionary thing was never translated. Huh? Right. No, yeah, and there's yeah, one other yeah. which, there's one other things uh, which should be remarked uh, uh, about this book. The print run of this missionary uh, uh, essay was about 350 books. 
it was very difficult for me to find only one copy here in the Netherlands. I never acquired one privately, but there are a couple of copies in, let's say, the National Library and maybe the, uh, the Library of Leiden University. But I guess that all these copies have been bought up by, uh, by good Christians and have been destroyed afterwards. The second uh, print run, same amount of books, also nowhere to be found. And that's why we decided to also republish this, uh, this treatise. And I don't know what happened to the books, but I think they are available uh, online still. So, I mean, you, they could not buy up all the copies, so to say. <laughs> That's very fascinating. And there definitely yeah. calls for a translation as well, I think. Yes, it, yes. It'll be it quite interesting. Work. It may work, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Certainly because Sri Lanka itself and its uh, relationship to Christianity already makes for a fascinating history, of course, between the, mm. the, the, the Portuguese initially followed by the Dutch and, and then the incoming British. They all had their own take on the matter. Um, so I think that would be worth checking out. Maybe we should turn to our third guest of today. Um, who I introduced earlier already um, and broadened the discussion a little bit. So our final guest of today is Lisbeth Pangaja Benning. Um, um, as mentioned earlier, um, studied history at the Rijks University of Utrecht in the Netherlands, um, but is mainly known as a dancer and has took, taken it on herself to translate this work um, and I'm very keen to learn more about what motivated you to translate this book, Paul's book, but also, of course, uh, um, Hafner's work and, and what you found interesting about him. Um, I came to Hafner because I was looking into the possibility of Western writers writing, uh, Western travelers in India writing about the Chidambaram temple for uh, research that uh, that was being undertaken by my late partner, Raja Dikshitar. Um, <clears throat> because the temple has left almost no history itself, except its own texts, uh, but no history. And um, so I came, I, I, I came across Hafner and I found that he wrote about dancers. So that kind of really attracted me. And then eventually I found out that uh, the travels on the Coromandel, the travels by Palanquin, were never translated in English. And I started translating bits and pieces, first uh, about the dancers and the chapter about Mahal Bali Puram. And um, I came into contact with Paul around that time and we discussed these things. And then he's, he, uh, he kind of requested or invited me, so why don't you translate my bio, uh, biography instead of mm -hmm. translating Hafner directly? So I, I thought about it and I thought, yeah, it would make things a lot more accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, in the meantime, the last 10, 15 years, the interest in India itself about its history, uh, about its heritage um, has, has grown quite a bit. I mean, like till 15, 20 years ago, there was almost next to no interest. I mean, yeah, the people were just struggling to survive. But now that is very different. Uh, also because of people who moved away from India, but are looking back at sort of their roots. So um, I thought it was a worthwhile project. And uh, I spent quite a bit of time on it. And um, it's already five years ago that I, that I did it. So it's... Uh, <laughs> A lot has happened since, and um, but I mean, Hafner is a very Hafner's original writings, especially, are a very important resource on what is a crucial, um, re relatively recent uh, era in Indian history. Yeah? The time around when the British took over everything, and um, yeah, there, there there is a lot we can still learn from from what Hafner writes about and observes in his books. Is there a particular example that comes to mind that particularly struck you about his work? Um, no, yeah, the, the lively way that he uh, writes. And um, I think also, yeah, although he's a romantic and he does, he, it, 
seems that he probably made up some bits. The descriptions about the postal service, about how villages were organized. Um, in uh, Travels by Palanquin, he describes all these villages that he moves through and like what, what they are producing and how their people are living. And he describes some festivals and, and you know, that is, that is, that is all, yeah, from, from a very different way of um, writing than I have, I have written, I have read other, other travel writers in India looking for historical materials. And um, he's quite unique in his approach and, and, also his love, you know, he was not looking down on India. He loved it. He admired it. And, um, yeah, I mean, actually the Europeans were in awe of India till, till about 1830. And then mm -hmm. it went completely upside down and people started looking down on the Indians. And that created a completely different literature even. Now, this kind of sort of romantic views, of course, are... Very nice, but it also is, um, I guess, in a sense, rather white. I mean, that was what Hafner was, obviously. Um, he came from, well, he, he was born and brought up in a, in a different era. Um, it's a particular, the, the, the way Hafner writes history has been, I guess, copied and adopted by other Westerners, often um, also accused of Orientalism to a certain degree. Um, earlier you said something striking, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I entirely agree about um, Chidamram being typically a place without, um, well, of which we know there's little history left. Isn't, um, do, don't we run, run the risk by reading a book by also kind of essentializing that again, essentializing a certain European way of history writing and uh, and reflecting on Asia, where, of course, there were at the time and still are countless other sources from which we can also learn. It's more of a broad question, like how can we tackle that? How can we still appreciate Hafner without falling into the well, trap he, that... Um, first you know, of all, he doesn't write... He, he didn't write about Chidambam at all. He, no, no, no. If he went there, he didn't write about it. Hmm. But, um, I mean, there probably are resources, uh, but they are on... on the, the history of these temples, but um, on, they are not accessible to me because I neither read Tamil nor Sanskrit properly. So, um, mm -hmm. and and my late partner, who was a Dikshitar, who belonged to the temple tradition, uh, to the family who's in charge of that temple, he he looked for um, foreign mm -hmm. authors because he 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 there was no literature he could find. I, I mean, if there is literature within India, it would be in manuscripts that would be in libraries, maybe in yeah. different scripts in, uh, you know, I mean, like the Marathas wrote a lot and they wrote in Marathi, in Lo Modi script. So yeah. even that wouldn't be that much accessible to, to an average Tamil. So, mm. the, the, I, I mean, well, we, my question wasn't necessarily about, yeah. of course, um, it was just an example, like how do okay. we reflect on that? It was more in general, of course, um, uh, what Hafner presents us with is a vision that also emerged from from his own time. Yeah, of course. And it, yeah. it, and and that sense, it presents a particular version of, of, of yeah. history writing that uh, course, we can yes. at the same time, yeah. be, we can be appreciated of it, but we can also be critical of it. Um, mm -hmm. so I was kind of looking like maybe can ask each of you to reflect on that for in terms of beyond the immediate appreciation for his his warm feelings for Asia, the, the wonderful way he writes, um, the energy that still emerges from that writing. How do we treat a text like this? Maybe, maybe we can start by Paul. Well, uh, of course, I know the, the text uh, more or less inside out. And mm -hmm. at first, we also thought that he was an armchair traveler, so that he hadn't been there at all. But then we started digging into uh, the, v the archives of the VOC, of the United Dutch East India Company in The Hague, and also in archives in uh, Colombo and in, uh, in London. And actually, to our big amazement, we found out that uh, although probably the, the 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 descriptions were not completely exact he wrote about people who we also can trace in the archives so mm -hmm. there is a degree of uh, reliability as well and another thing which is very important 
the source material we have, if you put that next to text of Hafner about the same event, for example, for example, in, in Cape Town, um, there was a slave girl who, who was supposed to have set fire to her slaveholder's home, <laughs> was also set to fire. And then you you see in, in the in the sources of the VOC, this is just treated as a mere fact. She was burned, you know, that was all. But Hafner describes how she was, you know, put to the to the haystack and burned and stuff like that. So um, and another thing that that was also a very good uh, uh, way to, to be very critical of using VOC archives or or let's say archives in general. Um, is that for uh, one of the ships ran aground uh, on the Indian coast, and then there were in the official sources that was written, yeah, because of the malfunctioning of the pilot and stuff like that. But yeah, Hafner gives the true reason. It was completely overloaded with smuggleware <laughs> of all the administrators. So, you know, that was the reason why they set the <laughs> ship sunk and not because the pilot made a mistake. Yeah. yeah. And so there are many, many things which can be, which can be checked using, uh, using Hafner's books. And then you come to a completely different picture than which is given in the official uh, documents. Um, Rosine, do you have some comments yeah. or insight to share here? Uh, well, I, I... I read Paul's biography very much uh, through the lens of travel writing rather mm -hmm. than academic history. Um, now, uh, I, I gather from, well, from the book and from what uh, both uh, Paul and Lisbeth uh, have said that uh, there's a lot of Hafner's eyewitness accounts that are of historical interest mm -hmm. and they can be interpreted in different ways. But that, to me, is not the main issue, at least not my interest. Uh, I mean, when, when I wrote my book, I, I was determined to write it not as an academic, not as a policy wonk, but as a travel writer. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's the lens that I, I view Hafner, I think. And for me, part of the success of Paul's biography is that it's, it's whetted my appetite to, to read Hafner, at least in English translation. Um, and what do I mean by a travel writing lens? I, I, I mean, for me, a good travel writer is someone who conveys a highly subjective experience. Uh, it's, it's not in the least objective. Uh, it's what he or she feels at a particular place, at a particular time, with the people that they encounter, the nature that they encounter, uh, and how little moments uh, can be used to convey a bigger picture, a broader canvas, as it yeah. were. Uh, and uh, I, uh, my, my impression is that uh, Hafner conveys that with, with real freshness and immediacy, but in a sense that's enduring. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, almost two and a half centuries after he actually experienced uh, all, these, all these encounters and all these, all these moments. So I think in those terms, uh, he, he succeeds. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm not really looking at, at it, uh, at it beyond, beyond that. Um, uh, so as, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it really as uh, at Hafner, as, as a travel writer and at his writing, uh, as, as, as very engaging travel writing more than anything else. I have, a, um, I have some, some comments from the audience, and one actually um, relates to Lisbeth's work as a translator, which probably also connects to what we're discussing right now. Um, it's by Leanne Davis, who, who asked, I'd like to know what challenges the translation presented. Did you feel the need to make the more accessible rather than translating directly? Or is it true to Hafner's style? Um, I stayed as true as possible. And one of the main challenges was to find equivalent words for in English, in modern English, for, uh, you know, old Dutch words that are not in use anymore and for which there may never have been appropriate English um, equivalents. Mm -hmm. 
And what about, would, would there also, for instance, terms that, that seem, if you would translate them directly, would no longer be fitting in a sense? Um, oh, oh, yes, there were. I mean, I, but at the same time, I try to stay as close as possible to Paul's original work because I yeah. don't think as a translator, I should sort of change the work as, as it is. It should cross from one language to another as as directly as possible hmm. and uh, i can't remember specific uh, i mean it, it's a long time ago i told you it's over five oh. years ago that i actually did this so yeah. i don't remember specific examples but but there, there were a few things that were really a struggle but what uh, one of the things i did was i would translate everything and then leave the difficult words and then just kind of meditate on it until i till i found the <laughs> right yeah um <laughs> yeah expression i English. think that's an excellent strategy i mean it's it, it is sometimes exactly what it requires like to meditate mm -hmm. to let it sink in and then yeah. suddenly it comes to you like okay this works best mm -hmm. then and i must yeah. say that the book reads fantastic that way i've read the original in Thank dutch you. of course and um mm -hmm. and really compliments there i have a, a a question here or more like a remark um, by eric go probably writing to us from singapore um i would I would like Paul's response to this, or thoughts on this. Um, what, what Eric says is the following. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Today we understand the anti-colonial stance as one in supporting of returning a, a colonized region to the rule of the natives. But what did an anti-colonial India world look like to Hafner at a time when Asia was only just beginning to get colonized and there were no immediate examples of colonized people fighting back successfully? except for the example of the Haitian Revolution. And of course, the Haitian Revolution was quite far removed from the immediate um, um, world of experiences, thoughts and debates I, in Asia, I guess. But it happened towards the end of his life. So, so how would you respond to this? Well, um, the, the English were in uh, very fierce battles with Haider Ali Khan and also at the time with the French. And that one make, made one of the British travelers at that time say, well, India <laughs> is lost for us because there was a big fleet of uh, the general or uh, Admiral de, uh, de Suffre uh, uh, near Madras. And that was like, you know, now it's, it's, it's kind of taken for granted that India was once uh, this part of the British empire. But at, in, six, in uh, 1784, that was not sure at all. And they were also in battle, and that was the thing with Haider Ali Khan. Um, he, um, he was very successful in, uh, in, uh, in, let's say, in combating the English. In the end, he lost. But that is one of the figures, along with, uh, of course, the Haitian uh, uh, freedom fighter, which, uh, which Hafner uh, enjoyed so much. So, um, yeah. no, there were actually examples of anti-colonialism already in its, uh, let's say, prenatal phase, yeah. <laughs> I think to, to add here, there are a couple of publications that are really worth mentioning that kind of sort of are all about that specific period of change towards the end of Hafner's life. One is, of course, very masterful, William Dalrymple's most recent book on, on kind of the rise of, of British colonialism in India, which really kind of brings that kind of detail to understand what was happening in the region when the hegemony of the Portuguese and the Dutch finally came to an end and the position of the Spaniards seemed fairly cemented in certain regions but didn't really move. So you get this advent of British colonialism. And the other book I'm thinking of is a recent <coughs> Alan Lane publication that um, that analyzes uh, the Haitian Revolution in, a, in quite a detailed way. The, um, the, the title escapes me for now, but if you type it in online, um, you'll find it. It's published by Alan Lane. Um, I see another question here, which I think also calls for uh, Paul's expertise. It's by Dries Lina, uh, who asks, despite only spending a couple of months in Sri Lanka, his curiosity to visit the mysterious kingdom of, of Kandy somewhat runs as a threat throughout his section on Sri Lanka. However, despite several opportunities and reflections to join an expedition, he never actually follows up on that feeling. How do you assess Hafner's relationship with his constructed image of Kendi? Yeah. Any thoughts well, on this, Paul? Well, this is a very difficult thing to say, but 
what I gathered from his travels in Sri Lanka was that these pathways leading up to the to the Candian Kingdom uh, uh, still existed at the time. He he was he was uh, living or but he lived there for for about a year. Yeah, but he was traveling right. through uh, through Sri Lanka, and he is referring more or less to uh, to the Vani people who lived there before. And he he uh, he in his uh, description of the island or or his travel on the in the island of Ceylon, it's it, there is a section which is more an enlightened section, so to say, on the nature of, of uh, Sri Lanka and also on the population. And there he wrote about uh, the, I don't, in Dutch it's called the Vani people, but uh, probably Razin will know what the real name is. Yeah. Uh, Razin, will, will, you, will you answer that? Um, maybe you could um, add to that, maybe some reflections on your thing, how this book will be received by Sri Lankans, uh, to whom it is of interest. Um, well, well uh, I, 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 uh, uh, just a point on the, um, on the Vanni. In, in contemporary parlance, Vanni refers to uh, a part of Sri Lanka in the north, uh, yeah. below the Rafna Peninsula and uh, above the the north central uh, ancient the kingdoms in the north uh, central part of the country, uh, it's scrub jungle for the most part, very sparsely populated, and was the heartland of the uh, the Tamil Tigers, the LTTE. Uh, uh, by Vanni people. Uh, Sri Lankans would generally understand the Tamil population uh, of the of the north uh, in in particular, as opposed to uh, the Sinhalese uh, in 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 the south, and of course uh, mixed race people, including Portuguese, Dutch, Burgers, and then Eurasians who were uh, descendants of the of of, of the British. Um, uh, how uh, would this book be received in, in Sri Lanka? Well, all I can do is encourage uh, uh, Sri Lankans uh, joining uh, in this event to uh, hot foot it, uh, uh, curfew restrictions allowing to yes. best, uh, in Kolpiti and buy the book uh, because it'll, it'll certainly uh, certainly repay, repay your attention and uh, and 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 interest. Uh, there's uh, 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 of course there, there, there is a constituency that's very much interested in in Sri Lanka's colonial history. It was a very long colonial history, perhaps the longest in Asia, 450 years in total, uh, divided into thirds quite neatly between the Portuguese, the Dutch in the middle, and then the British until independence uh, in 1948. Uh, and of course, with <coughs> considerable differences uh, between the colonial powers, not least in the way they treated uh, uh, religion. Um, I, I, I would, uh, my own view is that um, for all the faults of British colonialism in Ceylon, of which there were several, and no doubt Hafner, had he been in Ceylon a few decades after he was there, would have been very critical. Uh, nevertheless, of the three colonial powers, the British, I think, were, relatively speaking, the best when it came to treatment of religion, because uh, they did more or less restore the freedom of, 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 of religion, uh, which both the Portuguese and the Dutch had, had oppressed. And, of course, the British didn't intend this, but uh, allowing a reasonably relaxed uh, freedom of religion in Sri Lanka, while of course, you know, promoting the Church of England as the established church uh, yeah. through activity, uh, mm -hmm. unintended consequences. They paved the way for uh, a single Buddhist revival and then a uh, Tamil Hindu revival in the late 19th century. That in turn provided the foundation for early 20th century nationalism that led to uh, independence. Uh, so, uh, so much for unintended consequences. Fascinating. So we're coming to an end of, um, 
of the discussion. So I, for one, would like to thank everyone uh, for their questions, certainly from the audience, but also, of course, from your contributions, Paul, uh, Lisbeth, and Rosine. Um, Yep. One thing that sort of stood out throughout the discussion, I thought, was the strength of of Hafter's work and the, the way it continues, and and really the brilliant way that that Paul has has made that available to a much wider wider audience. And I, I hope that other authors follow suit in in making such work ac ac accessible because it also kind of. Um, it, it kind of changes on our, our ideas on imperialism, on how it was kind of joined by everybody. It, it, it kind of challenges our, our ideas of thinking that people at the time weren't uncritical of what, ha what was happening in the colonies. And if you reflect on that in, in broader discussions currently on, on Black Lives Matters or as it is happening currently in the Netherlands on, on how we should treat uh, uh, what the, the museum collections and otherwise, I think that you know it provides us with tools also to point at and to critique those who say that nothing should change and we should let it all in the past. And I think that's one of the strengths of the book as well. And I think it, it's fantastic to know that it's easily available at Barefoot and I would really like to thank Barefoot also for hosting this session besides uh, NUS Press. Um, and I certainly do hope that Sri Lankans will be able to make their way back easily to Barefoot Cafe and Barefoot Bookshop soon. Um, I know the kind of central place it has in, in social life in Colombo, and it's sad to think that it's, it's not bustling as usual. Um, anyway, thank you all again. Thank you, Paul, for this session. Thank, thank you, you. Lisa, for your thank contributions. You. Thank, thank you, you Rustin. Yeah. Um, I think maybe I'm just going to ask Paul, perhaps if he wants to have some some concluding thoughts or thanks or um, uh, words of wisdom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, it was uh, great launching this book in this way. It's it was really an experiment, uh, which I was very much interested in, in view of the fact that we are. Uh, at the moment, organizing a, a huge conference with more than 2,000 people in Kyoto in August 21. And uh, of course, this will partly be uh, be live, but certainly will have a hybrid form. So I, I really like the format of the meeting. And I want to thank you, Michiel, for all the very nice words you said, and also Razine and Lisbeth for uh, being able to join in. And um, yeah. People, yeah, it's it was it's it's great, and I think I mean really the thoughts of Hafner should become more known in the world still. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that that concludes the session. I think um, there's some final words by NUS Presses Peter. So, without much further ado, thank you so much. Thank you for for seeing you all in good health, and hope to meet you all again in person soon, and hope to be back in Sri Lanka soon as well. Um, <laughs> That's it. On to you, Peter. Thank you very much, uh, Miguel. Thank you so much for, uh, for ably hosting and uh, leading this discussion. Thank you, everyone, um, uh, for, for, for being here. And for those of you who stuck around online, uh, just to repeat, the book's available. I'm in the publisher. That's what I do. The book's available at Barefoot Books. Uh, it's available in Singapore at Good Bookshops and also uh, through the NUS Press website. You'll get a discount if you use the discount code, which has been flashing. Oh, there it is. Uh, you'll get a special discount as well. Uh, and it's also available on some of our uh, favorite uh, global online bookshops, you know the ones. Um, so it is it is available uh, in, in most territories around the world already. Um, so do, do have a look and uh, thank you again and thanks to good friends at Barefoot for co-hosting. We hope we gave a little bit of a flavor. That's it, Make I'll show the book. Where's my copy? <laughs> and, um, all the best to everyone. <laughs> See you later. Bye. Bye. bye bye. Zoom hands, zoom bye. hands. <laughs> bye bye.